and um, grab your book at page chapter 18. Chapter 18, Lighting Brand Circuit for the Workshop. We're going to be ha hatching all these stuff, guys, and going over and over, reviewing a lot of stuff as we go through. So this chapter is really quick review, not a whole lot of in it, chapter 18. Okay, so I want to remind you guys, this chapter talks a room in the basement, one area in the basement of the book that we have, and they're calling it the workshop. One thing you have to understand about this workshop, guys, is unfinished part of the basement. If it's unfinished, it doesn't matter what you call it. As long as it's unfinished part of a dwelling, then you don't apply the rule of 6 slash 12 and the, the two-foot rule and all this good stuff. You do not have to apply it on unfinished part of a basement. Does that make sense? But they want to make it a shop. So we know it's going to be a shop. So we're going to have add actually more receptacles because we know we're going to make it a workshop. Does that make sense? So by code, if it's unfinished basement, part of unfinished basement, all what you need really in reality is just one receptacle, GFCI, and a light with a switch, either the switch part of the fixture or on the wall. That's all what you need. But since they single-handedly decided to make it a shop, they want to add a bunch of other things that you guys are going to be looking at. So as always, we'll look at the GFCI, AFCI, and the wiring conduits and so forth. Um, Unfinished basement, um, okay. So a couple of things, guys, since it's unfinished basement, I want you to understand is, do we need an arc full circuit interrupters for unfinished basement? No. Do we need a GFCI for unfinished part of the basement? Yes. So all your receptacles have to be GFCI. Lights, outlets, and receptacle outlets, unfinished basements, they don't have to be AFCI, right? So that's very, very important thing. Um, the AFCI, the AFCI, my friends, have to be accessible, accessible location. Very important that readily accessible. The AFCI have to be readily, uh, the G, I'm sorry, the GFCI have to be readily accessible. Um, so that's basically the most important thing. You need, you need all the receptacles, if any, to be GFCI. Um, and they have, they have to be a readily accessible location. Do I account for the unfinished portion of the basement in the three volt per square foot calculation? Yes. Why? Because only if it can be finished in the future. How would you know if it's a basement can be finished or not in the future? For example, the mechanical room, definitely nobody's going to make a mechanical room where the furnace is. Nobody's going to make this a bedroom. It's not code. But the, the workshop room, can I change a workshop in a basement a room into a bedroom one time or a living room or a family room or a play area easily so that's adaptable for future change then you apply the three volt m per square foot for it uh workbench we have a workbench we'll look at this one guys let's let's go directly into actually all the way to the layout here's what we're, that they're looking at this is probably the most important thing about the whole deal um here's your uh, so-called workshop as far as we are concerned, and the code, the code concerned, it's unfinished part of the basement. Code-wise, all what you need is one light, one GFCI receptacle. Now, since we know it's going to be a, a workshop, the smarter than Chad brought one circuit here to feed the uh, GFCI, GFCI fit through. There's another circuit that's feeding another freezer, one for the freezer here. These are not code. Good ideas, though. We have a sump pump here that we brought the circuit for the sump pump. Very good idea. We brought also a circuit that feed receptacle on the bench here. And we have a multi-outlet assembly. Can you guys see that? What they did is a multi-outlet assembly. Everybody knows what a multi-outlet assembly. You're looking at it right there on the wall or right here in the front of you, right in the front of your desk. That's multi-outlet assembly. Plugged in or hardwired. So right on the bench, because that gentleman who's living there is a handy man or a handy woman. Um, that would be a lady. Um, and because of that, they want to have multiple outlets, guys, right on the bench so you can plug the equipment. So that's multi-outlet assembly becomes very handy if you have a concentration of loads on one location. For example, look at the bench in front of you. You have a multi-outlet assembly right in front of you. Why? Because you have concentration of things you need to plug in in, a sh in, a, in, a, in an area. So that's, that's what they did. So let's just review what they did, guys. They brought a, a, um, um, uh, um, a circuit here to feed two receptacles have to be GFCI, another circuit for the freezer because they will have their beer there while they're working. 
Uh, they also have um, a GSA receptacle and um, on the bench right here, multi element receptacle fit from another circuit. So that's for the receptacle. Also, we have a sump pump in that corner since we're in the basement. Sump pump needs its own 20 amp receptacle and um, and uh, 20 amp circuit. Then they, they brought then they brought the circuit for all their lights. And their lights, if you guys look at the, the way they, they, they switch, we have a light right above the bench. Can you guys see that light right above the bench? So you can see what you're doing. And they have a fan over here. So an exhaust fan. And they have um, a bu bu multiple lights in different locations. Multiple lights that you can control individually by full, um, by full chain. Or you can control them all together by a switch. Can you guys see that, what they did? They have a switch that can control all these lights, turn them on and off, or individually, if you are not in this area and you want to turn this light off, what would you do? You go to that little switch here and you push the switch, you control them individually. That's interesting, right? Full chains um, that you can control them individually or you can control them all together at the same time via a switch. That's what they're doing in this living room. Do I have to do this? Is this code? To do all, is this must do by code? No. Is it a good idea? Of course it's a good idea, especially if you're going to be working in this area. Anybody can tell me what this transformer is doing right here? What is this transformer doing? T for transformer. This one is for your doorbell. They have a doorbell. So you, you need uh, you need to feed your doorbell from the 120, convert to 24 volt, and go for your doorbell front and back and chime. So that's what they did in this area. That's what they did in this area. Any question guys about this? So the junction box with the transformer? With the transformer, you've seen them, yeah, attached to the side of the junction box. Commonly used in residential guys. Um, they take a, a box in the basement, they attach a transformer, nibble the transformer to the box, a metallic box, and then they feed the transformer directly from there. Sometimes they nibble them directly into the panel, if you've seen them in the basements. That's common for transformers that feed, um, feed doorbells. Any question, guys, about the layout? Any question? Again, all this, guys, really, you don't need, only you need one receptacle here. But obviously, if you have a sump pump, you need one for the sump pump. Freezer, you can have one for the freezer dedicated, or you can plug the freezer from a multi-outlet assembly, a multi-outlet um, switch, or receptacles. Any question, guys, about this? Now, when you're wiring in the basement, because it's concrete, guys, you can't put the romics right against the concrete, right? We're wiring, our wiring methods is romics in residential. I can't put romics against, directly against the concrete. So you have to use some type of wiring methods other than romics because it's concrete, especially in the concrete area. The conduit of choice that they use in residential is EMT, EMT or PVC. A lot of people use EMT. So, for example, I have a receptacle here attached to the block, and I need to bring a power to it with Romix cable. What do I do? I put a coaxial, uh, put an EMT conduit to the box, and bring my my NM cable right to it to protect it from physical damage, and that's how I wire that receptacle, an EMT conduit. Either use the cable inside it, or you can wire it. Use wires. Most of the time, you, you continue with the uh, NM cable directly, the Romix right into the EMT conduit. So keep in mind, if you have a basement and it's a block or concrete in the basement, not sheetrock, then you, you need to, everything is exposed, surface mounted, so you don't have to dig a hole right into the block, I guess. Uh, then you have to use a different wiring methods. The second wiring methods, notoriously famous for concrete is what? It's going to be um, EMT conduit. EMT conduits. Any question is? I want to bring to your attention that there's also a little panel here for these. This might not be even a panel. Okay, we'll look at the layout guys in a second here. No. All right, let's get that one. So we got that. Um, this is just a couple of articles that tells you GFCI. Um, and 50 to 20 amp have to be GFCI in the basement, if you don't believe me. Uh, make it mandatory that at least one receptacle you have to have in an unfinished basement. This is just article that tells you at least one receptacle, all receptacles, if any, have to be GFCI. We talked about the workshop, guys, and we had the plug-in. 
right above the workshop, we can have a plug-in light or a plug-in multi-out assembly, a multi-out assembly plug-in like the one right in front of you. So you can plug multiple equipments in it or right at the top of the bench, you also have either hardwired or a pl most likely plug-in light, fluorescent light. And you've seen them how it's really nice to work if you're doing on the work on the bench. Okay, well, as you come, as you come, that's, this is what we're saying, guys. If this is surface mounted on uh, concrete, I cannot bring the raw mix directly on against the concrete. You need physical protection for the raw mix, the uh, wire. So what do you do? EMT conduit is your conduit of choice. You bring an EMT conduit right in here to protect it from physical damage. Physical damage. <clears throat> Um, there's a couple of rules here. It says, it says you have to protect the cable within 12 feet. If you guys read through the NM cable, must be protected within 12 feet of a point where the cable enters the conduit. The conduit also has to be protected. Um, uh, listed conduit with adapters. You have to have an adapter here. Why do you think we have an adapter here? Um, adapter, the adapter that you use because you don't, you don't want to damage the conduit, so you have to have some uh, uh, insulation pu pushings here as you put your cable in it so you don't damage the um, the jacket of the NM cable. So a few requirements for people who are installing it, you guys or anybody else. Any question about wiring on with raw mix on a concrete or a block wall? EMT conduit, you bring it into the EMT conduit, support it 12 feet from the point of entering the conduit, you have to support the conduits. Uh, appropriately every three feet or so and um, you also have to have an insulation pushing right here where it, it protects the cable as it enters the conduit as it enters the conduit <clears throat> okay so that's unfinished basement this is this guys talk about unfinished basement how do you wire unfinished basement um, two things Dear to my heart, if you're wiring, this not a, doesn't mean a big deal. These numbers, guys, keep them in your mind. Conductors, cables with conductors smaller than 2, 6, and 3, 8 must be run through the hole poured in the joist. If you have a conductor smaller than 2, 6, uh, 2 conductors number 6, or 3 conductors number 8, smaller than that, you can put, you, you can make holes in the joist and run them. But, uh, number two, smaller than two. So two, six, and eight, three, eight, you can actually mount them to the joist. Or so expose runs of, so you can mount them to the jo joists here or running boards. Does that make sense? When you do the wiring, two ways of doing wiring in the basement, guys. Um, you either drill a hole in the joist and run these conductors. All the conductors smaller than these two sizes, like number 14, two, 14, three, 12, two, 12, three, 12, four. Uh, 14 4 all have to be run right through the hole these sizes and larger and what do you guys think because number six two six is a big boy um, so you're gonna have a bigger hole to pull it through what, what's gonna happen if you drill through the joist a bigger hole you yeah you compromise the integrity the structural integrity of the house so they're allowing you if you have these size cables to put them right at the bottom attach them to the bottom of the joist they, they test people on these all the time on their master exam. If you have exposed runs, if exposed runs of armor cable must closely follow the building surface of the running boards. Armor cables can be run on the underside of the joists in basement attics. Armor cable, AC or MC cable, you can run. Why? Because they're fully protected under the, uh, the joists. Okay, we talked about, guys, if you have um, EMT conduit, you're looking at it right here. The cheapest, easiest conduit you can install. Easy to bend, easy to install. Fittings are perfect. So that's why it's your conduit of choice in a residential if you need a physical protection for the cable. So that's, um, uh, it's consider it's a tubing, guys. They don't consider actually a con. It's a tubing because it's thin, very thin shell. A conduit will be rigid uh, EMT or so forth. But not a big deal for us. Uh, rigid mill conduit, the only place where, and we talked about conduits guys before, the only place you're going to use a rigid mill conduit or intermediate is 
for the mast. As you come to the building, right in here, as you come to the building, bring the power to the building um, the, through a mast. There has to be um, rigid steel or um, rigid steel or intermediate. Maybe fastened to the masonry, EMT. A couple of places, guys, about supporting the EMT. Obviously, where if you're wiring with EFT or PVC or whatever, you need to, as you can see, all these X's are places where you have to support. This is support of a conduit, supporting of a box, support of the box, support of the box. Um, EMT conduit, for the most part, guys, we support them every three feet from every box and at, um, I think, five feet intervals, if I remember that right. You, if you go to the EMT conduit size, it will tell you how far, but every three feet of every, from every box, if you're wearing with them, you're going to support every three feet. Obviously, that's the maximum. You can support them closer than that. But also, the boxes have to be supported as you put them. Here's what they don't want you guys to do. When you wire with EMT or any other conduits, you're supposed to not to exceed the, remember the degrees, the, how many degrees you can't bend? 360 degrees that sticks 360 degrees you cannot support more than 300 you cannot go more than 360 degrees what do you do phil if you need to go more than 360 degrees junction box pull box um the, another thing they don't want you to do is before you pull your conductor you have to build the system i've done that a couple of times because it's easier but you're supposed to build your conduit system completely from point A to point B, and then you pull the wires through it. Why? Because if you don't do that, you pull it halfway through it, then you put your conduit, you could, you could damage the insulation of the conductor. Right? So if I want to pull, as you can see, if I want to pull all these conductors in these conduits, the first thing I build the conduit system, that's rough end. We were talking about rough end, guys. You put your conduits in, and then you pull your conductors through them and put your devices. How do you get a fish tape in the upper? The upper corner here? Yeah. That's your problem. <laughs> <laughs> if there's an offset here? Yeah, there's an offset. That's why, guys, going to a 360 degrees is not a good idea. I mean, that would be really hard with an offset. Offset here, an offset here. Actually, you exceeded it if you had an offset, if you think. The only thing this is legal is if you're going right through. Uh, look at that little offset there. That's an angle, right? That can't do. So the only thing, you can't put an offset in the box based on this rule because you exceeded 360 degrees. The only way you can do that if, if the conduit is coming right through it without an offset. And it's still tough. So 360 degrees, depending if this is uh, 100 feet, good luck. 20 feet, uh, but 5 feet, piece of cake, you know, it depends how far too. What's, what's the distance from here to here or from here to here? How high you go. So just because you're allowed 360 degrees, not a good idea if you have long runs to go 360 degrees, guys. Doing what, what we have done right here is not a good idea on the long. What they do here, <clears throat> um, Chris, what they do that if you flip this one the other way around and it looks something like this, um, if it sticks here, they call it a four point saddle. When you are going over, when you bend EMT or conduit, <clears throat> they call it four-point saddle. So you want to go over a big dot. You come here, over, you go up, over, and down again, and you continue. That's a good, a good application for it. Um, and most of the time, it's very short. Most of the time, it's very short. Otherwise, it's a disaster. <laughs> when you do conduits, guys, all of them have to be straight. Bends and offsets must be true. Vertical runs down the surface of the walls must be plumb. So you have to do a, a workman-like manner or work-person-like manner. You can't do a crooked. Look at these. They're really nice, right? If Chad is doing this one, probably will be a 70-degree angle this. Um, conduit fill. I'm not going to review the conduit fill. They talk about the conduit fill in this chapter, guys. You are experts right now. If we have one conductor, one conductor, one cable, we can fill only 53%. One conductor or one multi-conductor cable. Two conductors, 31. Three conductors, which is 90% of the time, you're going to be at three conductors, 40. If you have Mr. Nibble, which is 24 inches or less, you fill it at 60. And we did examples, and we took a lot of work on that one. Ambicity, guys. This talks about the ambicity. 
uh, reviewing the ambicity. I want to tell you guys, uh, you know the rules of ambicity, right? 100 or less, where do you go? 60 degree column. More than 100? 75. <clears throat> unless you know otherwise, unless the terminals are rated for otherwise. If you have more than three hot carrying, carrying conductor, what do you do? You do rate. If you, um, if you have a temperature different than 30 degrees Celsius, what do you do? You do it. And we did examples on calculation on that one, so I'm not going to lose sleep over this. Um, okay. Overcompiction device. Overcompiction device, Chris, they're reminding all of us that the conductors can't, you can't put an overcompiction device on a conductor if the conductor is not rated for it. Take this. If I have a number 14 conductor, what's the overcompiction device rated for number 14? 15 amps. How about number 12? 20 amps. Number 10, we're talking cover. 30 amps. These are the small conductor rule. Now you go higher than that, then number eight. Number eight, you're gonna, if number eight can give you 40 amps, I can't protect it more than 40 amps. So you can have to protect it with an overcompiction device that matches its ambiguity. They allow you to go lower than that up to 800. If you guys remember, up to 800. Uh, after that, you start matching, and that's what they say. Please highlight this one, guys. It says the next rated fuse can be used when a conductor does not match the ambiguity of, of the overcompiction device. Up to 800. After 800, we start matching the overcompiction device. I emphasize this a lot, guys, when we go to the commercial because that's becoming a big deal. So, but if you know it now, you saved yourself some time listening to Chad. Uh, okay, some this is a couple of examples about uh, derating multi outlet assembly right in front of it. Why do we use a multi outlet assembly, guys? Because it's concentration of things that I need to do. Where's the good application for multi outlet assembly? A bench, you have a bench, you have multiple drills and heaters and welder and everything, right? Uh, so soldering equipment and uh, and your uh, DVD and your TV and whatever you're going to plug in that there and watch and see light plugged in. So you have a concentration of load in a smaller area. That's a great application for multi-out assembly. What's a multi-outlet assembly? A, a piece of equipment like right in front of you with multiple outlets pre-wired, pre-manufactured. All what you have to do, either plug it in or hardwire. Does that make sense? Uh, Article 380 talks about multi-out assembly. <clears throat> uh, Article 380 talks about, again, multi-out assembly and um, there's application for multi out assembly, guys. For example, you cannot take that multi out assembly and go through the wall. And there's exception for that one. If you go through the wall, then they have to you have to be able to open this side of the wall and the other side of the wall, and the part inside the wall have to be completely closed. So there's a few things like this. For the most part, as dry location. Um, can't go through walls requirement for them. You have to mount them properly based on the manufacturer recommendation and so forth. Here's what we're talking about, guys. Now, I want to bring to your attention, Nick, my friend, this multi-outlet assembly is not GFCI equipment, and they're installed in a location that you need GFCI. So how do you GFCI a multi-outlet assembly? You feed it from a GFCI receptacle. That's the best way to do it, either plugged in or hardwired. So if it's a multi outlet assembly like this, I can plug it into a GFCI, then everything in a receptacle right here is GFCI. Why does it have to be GFCI? Because the location is a GFCI location. The location is GFCI location. Any question guys about this? I always, when I, when I teach wiring guys, there's close to 50 ways of wiring things, 50 ways in the code. So you, Nick, and Ashley, and everybody else, you're going to be, guys, the professional who are going to pick the right wiring methods for the location. For multi out assembly, it has some type of wiring methods, some type of wiring methods. Uh, so you're going to pick it for the right location, whereas you can't do the whole house with multi outlet assembly. It'll be expensive, doesn't do what you want it to do. Where would you use it? Right, like on the bench. Some people use them in, uh, in a kitchen, which I don't like it. multi out assembly for the kitchen, GFCI protected, and the countertop. Um, either you can have them, as I said, um, um, hardwired, or you can plug them in. The last thing in this chapter, guys, it tells us it's really a good idea 
when you're doing residential single family dwelling especially to allow one or two conduits two inch pvc to go from the basement all the way up to the attic and some of you guys i know probably chris anybody who owned homes for a long time can agree with this over over the years you change things in your house and you wish you could go from the basement where your where your panel is all the way to the second or third floor if you have um, and you really wish if you can reach the attic, if you can reach the, the attic guys and the basement, pull things from the basement to the attic, you can go almost anywhere in the way we design the homes in the US. So that's what they're suggesting for a future. If, if I'm to design a house for you, I would say, well, it's really a good idea to put a two inch PVC conduit from the bottom all the way up to the attic. <clears throat> um, so it will be a good idea for future for future uh, explanation, for future um, pulling wires, PVC, whatever, pulling new circuits, not code. So that's basically what I have, my friends, for you here. Um, I have um, a couple of things just to show you. Okay, just the wiring method, guys. My only intention when we throw all this one for you guys is just to know another example of wiring things. Another example of wiring things. I do have a question for you, though. Why do you guys think we have to... Why do we have, why do we have two conductors here? A three. Why do we have three here? Three conductors, right? Is that three conductors? Three words. Is it a three-way switch? Not a three-way switch, though. So one bringing the hot to the switch, one switched hot, and the other one is neutral. We need a, a neutral to every switch, a hot coming to the switch, and switched hot back to switch all these lights. All these lights are switched. Um, all these lights are switched directly. And you can also control them. I like these guys, cold chain where you can control them individually if you want to, or you can co control them all together from a switch. Everybody's with me here? Where you can just switch them all on, but if I want to, that corner, I'm working here, and I don't want, I want to save energy, I can go pull the chain uh, down there and turn it on. That's basically what they're doing. I was bring to attention, guys, that they're doing right here, the uh, multi arc assembly here, and they have a light that's actually, I think it's, I uh, can't remember if it's plugged in light or hardware. A fan, as well as the transformer for um, for the garage door, uh, for not the garage door, for the doorbell, as well as a sump pump, and we have GFCI, one GFCI receptacle for for the freezer. Any questions about this? Questions about that? Okay, we talked about this one. Here's the pull chain where you can um, control individually, control the light individually. EMT conduits, these are threaded, rigid, or IMC. EMT conduits, non-threaded. Couple of hardware that you can use with them. Talked about that one. Couple of equipments you can use. Um, hardware, again. Uh, nipples and 120 circuits, talked about this. Here's a, a multi-outlet assembly in an office area, guys. We can put a multi-outlet assembly. Look at how many things you can plug in. Multi-outlet assembly, guys, they can have, you can buy them in so many ways. You can have two section compartments, one low voltage, one high voltage. You can plug in your high voltage and low voltage from the same assembly, as long as you have separation between the high and the low. You see them all the time. Uh, here's another place. This is typical. Oops, we have it too. This is a typical multi-outlet assembly, guys. The problem is this is not GFCI, so you have to have a GFCI protected um, circuit breaker here. Feeding, you can see, you can imagine how many things you can plug in here. And remember, they're not simultaneously used. They're just plugged in for convenience. So instead of keeping plugging and unplugging, everything is plugged in. You can use them um, at any time for your own convenience. In the kitchen, sometimes you put them. 
multi out assembly a multi outlet light this is a very nice way guys of showing a multi outlet uh, multi wire circuit multi wire circuit a couple of lights with multi wire circuits so anybody can tell me and what they're asking you guys to do is they're asking you to find the current at different location anybody can tell me what's the current here right at this point what's the current take the 7 plus the 12 what's going to happen 5 amps how about here at this point i have 1 plus 12 13 minus 7 what would that be right that would be 6 amps right the difference between them right at this point how about this point here add add the top if you don't want to just add the top here and add the bottom here and subtract them okay so 7 11 minus uh minus 13 what would that be three two two amps and then at this point the same thing guys keep adding all this and subtract them from each other so we have 14 minus uh blah, blah, blah. What, what the 13 plus 5 is 18. 14 minus 18 is what four and the last one is take all this on this leg and all this on this leg see how it, it keeps the neutral keeps changing as you add the load so i have let's do all of them i have 10 and 22 right 22 at the top 22 amp on my right here press 8 plus 4 is 12 plus 10 uh, 22 right 22 how about the bottom at the bottom how many do i have i have 6 plus 4 10 plus 12 22 22 amp what do you guys think the current is going to be here 22 minus 22 is what big fat zero i hope you wouldn't leave done what you not know of that how the neutral adds up as you go that's why guys when we design a system like this we say we always size if this was, was number 12 what do you think the neutral has to be and the other number 12. why because suppose all the lights at the top were off suppose all the lights at the top were off what do you think the conductor at the bottom would be carrying 22 the neutral would be carrying 22 amps 22 amps suppose that these were off right just tear them off bam bam so each one of these is off 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 so what do you guys think the current here is going to be 22 amps. What do you think that 22 here is going to go? It's going to go all the way back to the neutral. And it's going to blow up it's going to, in, my, in this application. In a case like this, this is 22. Most likely, this guy will be number 10. And this will be number 10. Just because. And this will be number 10. And the circuit breaker will be 30. And well, the circuit breaker will be 30. Right? I can do that. I can put a 30 circuit breaker number 10 and feed. Not commonly used, but you can use feed from a 30 amp circuit breaker based on this example. Can a number 10 handle 22 amps? Yep, no problem, Chad. Bring it on. I think, watching guys, this is just a good example of multi outlet assembly, adding the neutral. How would you go about measuring a clamp? A clamp ammeter, you go clamp right onto the neutral. You're saying if you take that clamp and move it? Along the wire, you'll you you will see that. Difference. You will see the difference. Yep. It does look like a solid wire. Uh, yeah, you grab here, and you grab here. Oh, here, the connection. Obviously, the connection is not going to be like this. You, you know, it's going to be wire knot, so you have to kind of maneuver yourself through finding the right conductor <laughs> at the right location. But it will, you will see the difference. You will see the difference. The Supposed to. Yeah. Most of the time, guys, remember these, just to FYI, this is going to be a wire knot here. In real life, this will be the same wire knot. This will be wire knot. This will be wire knot. This will be wire knot. All these, um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight conductor wire knots. Ooh, you're pushing it. Um, so most likely, these will be under one wire knot, and these will be under another wire knot, and the two are tied together somehow. Um, so it wouldn't be the way we're showing it. No, it's, it's just a yeah. physical property. Yes. Putting a clamp on a wire. You should get. Solid. You should get. From a practical standpoint, it's a solid wire. Yes. 
you should be able to if it's a cable you can't because the cable you will carry all of them in the same you know you cancel the effect now the rest my friends I'm going to trust you Rob my friend to take this point to point wiring and I know Chris is going to be doing that compare this go point to point wiring based on the layout in that room and wire this area with multi outlet branch circuits so not a biggie I think this circuit came directly to here this circuit came directly to here right I do if I remember that right and then you continue with your wiring guys when we wire this remember every light need a hot a switch hot and a neutral and every switch need a neutral need a hot to energize it and a switch leg to go back out of it to switch something if you remember that and if you give me this and you say why are this chat there's a hundred ways i can wire this this is not enough you have to show me the lay the um, the cable layout so just by doing this guys you can't there's a hundred ways of i can bring this circuit right here and wire everything here from this circuit so anyway so as you wire this point to point wiring you have to pay attention to the layout which you already seen The rest of it, guys, is doing calculation for these circuits. Um, 20 amp circuits, cables, conduits. So, based on that's all what I need to do. Based on this layout, you should be able to do the point to point wiring. And I encourage you strongly, guys, to do so. Any question? Any question about the workshop? It's really nice, gives you different ideas of doing things differently. Okay, let me, I'm going to give you guys five minutes and I'm going to go over the pumps. Stretch a little bit for five minutes. Chapter 19. There are three things in chapter 19 I want to pay attention to. Really. Um, three major topics in this chapter I want to highlight. Number one is pumps, which is motors, water pumps. A few things about two types of water pumps. From an electrical point of view, guys, we're going to learn how, what do we need to size and provide for a pump, which is a motor. The second thing is a water heater. And again, how does the water heater works? Really on your own, understanding, great. But what I care about is how do you size a feeder, a disconnect, an over device for a water pump. And the last thing, since the water pump, especially the, heat, the, the water heater, guys, is... Um, a major equipment of consuming power how does the utility control your usage of these major equipments they call them off peak meters off peak meters and off use and so forth so three topics in this chapter i'm not going to look at the lingo i'm going to just look at pictures like this so it makes it interesting and um, anybody have seen guys a uh, submersible pump live in the in the rural area where you don't have a city pressure and city water. If you live in that area, most likely you have a submers submergible pump. There are two types of pumps. One is the, uh, the jet pump. You're looking at that called the jet pump. The other one is the submersible pump. So let me tell you what we care about these pumps and then how do we work. What we care about these pumps, guys, is right in here. Um, what we care about it is we need to power this baby. So I'm coming in here. I need I need a cable to power it, and this supposedly is going to be somehow tied into connected to the system here with a controller. But let's say just it's 240. I need an uh, uh, some type of an over connection device to connect it. I need also some type of a disconnect means, some type of a disconnect means so I can disconnect it. And what do you think? A cable. Cable. Disconnect and overturn protection device. Now, can I trust that you guys know how to size a conductor for a pump? A pump is a motor. If I give you the horsepower of a motor and the voltage, can you find the full load current from NEC 430, um, 248, and multiply by 1.25 and, and size the conductor based on 
75 degree column, 310 to 16, right? Typical. The second thing, disconnect. If I give you a disconnect, what do you do? You take the full load current of that and multiply by 115 like we did and size your disconnect. Why do we have a disconnect? Disconnect to disconnect the equipment for safely work on equipment. Over competition device. Over competition device, we size it. You take the full load current for the horsepower, multiply it by 2.5. For example, if it's a, an inverse side circuit breaker, and you go up if it's not a standard. Why do we have an over competition device? Short circuit and ground faults. That's as far as we're concerned. The, the second one that you guys are looking at, this is a controller. A controller. How do you make this pump? Um, how do you make this pump work? How do you make this pump work? You need a con some type of a controller. The controller here is actually a pressure, a pressure switch. So it works on pressure, turning on and off based on pressure. We're going to see how it works that baby. So any question guys about this? So really, in, in all reality, all what we're having <clears throat> is um, um, an overcam fiction device for, for whatever reason here. So I have my overcam fiction device. I have, um, depending on where you put this one, and um, I have my conductors, and I'm right next to the equipment. I put, I'm going to put a disconnect right next to the equipment, and I'm going to put a controller, and I'm going to tie my pump. And that's what they're basically doing. This is my overcurrent protection device. This will be my uh, conductor, conductors, or feeders. This will be my disconnect right next to the equipment. And this will be my controller. And we size this one, guys, for you all the time. A submersible pump is a motor. We size it exactly as you see. Overcome fiction device, short circuit ground pole, feeder to bring the power into it, uh, disconnect to isolate the equipment so we safely can work on it. The controller is to start and stop the motor. Right? Okay, how does this work? You have a well, and this is mostly in rural areas. I don't think you'll have it in the cities because we have water is... The water pressure is provided by the city here, if you live in cities. If you live in rural areas and you have your own well, so what they do, guys, is they have a, what they call it the, the jet pump. The way it works, we have to have a tank. Number six is a tank, recharged water tank. You charge it to a certain uh, pressure, and I think, what is it, 40? I think it works between 40 PSI and 20 PSI. You really don't need to know that. So when the pressure in this tank reached 20, it's the, 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 the uh, pressure switch shuts down, close, so that's, that closes, and then in return, it starts the pump at the pressure of 20, means the tank is low. It keeps pumping, 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 and it, until it reaches 40 PSI, meaning the tank is what? Full. When the tank is full, the pressure itself pushes these contacts to open them, because the last thing you want to do <laughs> is to have a pump that you personally go turn it on and off, right? That's not good. You want a pump in your house that you can depend on so you can pipe all your house with this water and the water is always there, right? You don't want to turn it on and off. It's like your furnace. You don't go turn your furnace on and off when you need heat, right? You turn it on, stays on. That's what the controller works. Works on the pressure. 20 starts, 40 stops, <clears throat> and it doesn't, uh, why do you guys think they have a limit? Why can't they just have every time it goes below 40, it starts? Can you imagine that? Every time the every time to go to the bathroom, we flush the toilet, the pump starts, fill, stop. Every time you go have a shower, the pump starts, fill, stop. What's going to happen to the pump over time? You're going to kill that pump. Start, stop, start, stop, start, stop. The smarter than Chad said, we can't just start it every time we need it. We need to have a, a range. So at this time, at this level, when you reach this level, start pumping all the way until you fill it and then stop and then use this this might take you a day or two to use this tank say a day we use this could go go on and then when you reach that level it pumps it starts up again so that maintain the pressure maintain the pressure um and allow the pump allow the pump not to kill itself in the process of starting and stopping any question guys about the pressure the, the pre-charge tank without this pre-charge tank you're doomed you can't, uh, the, your pump is going to be pumping and stopping and starting. You can't control it. So how does this work? The smarter than chair, they have this jet, in, the impeller, the jet pump. It, you have to fill this. The way we start is you fill it up to here when you start, when you fill it. And then this pipe is filled. So when it starts, it shoots, it shoots down this um, drive pipe. They call it a drive pipe. It shoots the water so 
fast in velocity that it sucks the water up the main channel. So look at this. This is coming very fast, very fast, fast, fast up here. When it pulls this, when it goes that fast, it starts pulling water into this major pipe and then goes all the way to the tank and then part of it goes back to keep pulling. I don't know if that makes sense. So there are two pipes. One is a dry pipe, very small. When, if you're a smaller pipe, the velocity will be very high. So if you shoot the velocity down very high and you lube it with this jet, the effect of lubing it, the smarter than Chad discovered, that actually sucks the water out of the well and shoots it through the bigger pipe all the way to the tank and part of it continues to be in that jet and the cycle keeps going on. You keep shooting the water down with this jet, sucking the water up into the main pipe, into the tank until you reach 40 PSI. That's the principle of operation. That's why they call it jet. Shoots very small pipe here. So you need two pipes, as you can see, to make this system work. There's some uh, uh, foot valve, guys, because you don't know the water to go down. You want this one to only, the water goes one way, not the other way around. Um, strainers, um, tail pipe, and jet, and all these suction pipe. This is the one that goes dry pipe, the one that takes it down, and the pressurized uh, water tank. You really don't need to know all this. That's mechanical. Nice to know it. What we need to know is, do we know how to size this for this motor? Yes, I have no doubt that you guys know how to do it, right? Any question guys about this pump? So it starts with a 5 horsepower, for example. You want to size the disconnect here, 2.5 times I. You need to size the conductor, 1.25 times I. From the NBC codebook, disconnect, 1.15 times I. Controller, based on the voltage and... Uh, the horsepower, you can size the NEMA controller, if NEMA, or a magnetic start. That's it. That's what our involvement in it. They talk about grounding. When you deal with pumps, guys, you have to ground the pumps. Most of these pipes are, a lot of these pipes are PVC pipes. So you have to pull with the circuit that's coming. You have to pull an equipment grounding conductor. And you ground the casing of the well, as well as the pump itself, the casing of the pump, as well as the, the, the tank. So everything has to be grounded. How do we ground it? We ground it with an equipment grounding conductor. Let's just say, for all practical reasons, guys, these were number 12. Then I will pull a number 12 conductor with the circuit so I can, I can, I can ground this and I ground the tank and ground everything with this number 12 grounding conductor. Very important. What they're telling you, Phil, is they don't want you to send a two wire for a 240 pump without a ground and you depend on the casing of the well as your ground. You can't do that. You have to tie the casing all the way to the equipment ground conductor in your system. Any question is how this pump works and what do we need to know from it? Any question? This comes as a package, guys. The controller, the pump, everything comes as a package. Our involvement in it, in, in the most of the time, is just providing an over protection device as well as a, as a, as well as a, a four conduct, a three conductor cable. Also, the disconnect and fusing the overload protection. The, yeah, if you have a disconnect with fuse inside it, that's your overload protection. So if you have a circuit breaker here in the panel, and then pull the circuit all the way to wherever the pump is located, right next to the pump, you need to have a disconnect. A disconnect on, looks like exactly like that one on the wall. And you can have a fuse in it or non-fuse. Most of the time, you don't need a fuse in it just to disconnect that circuit. Any question about this pump, guys? This is not the most common one. The most common one is coming in a second here. Is the fuse mandatory if the motor, if the package doesn't come fused? Or how, how do you know when you need to add a fuse? And unless the manufacturer say a fuse, provide a fuse at location, you don't provide a fuse. So what do you do? You take a, a 20 amp circuit for it from here, two pole 20 amp circuit with number 12. If you're going far away, probably number 10 because of the voltage drop, all the way to the equipment, right next to it, most likely you're gonna put a disconnect, some deal from the disconnect, you go feed the controller. And all what you do is just you bring wire to the controller. These wires in the back, guys, the controller um, is already tied to the tank somehow and you don't you don't worry too much about how the pressure switch is wired it's usually wired um you just provide a feeder directly to the pump two hots a grounding conductor 
And a number 10 conductor, if it's far away, or number 12, if it's not with a 20 amp circuit, most of the time you're good to go. Otherwise, you size it based on the code. Okay, let's go um, look at the second one, guys. Here's what the here's exactly what what they require from us. Um, thank you, Chris. That's exactly what Chris was talking about. Here's my panel. Look at my panel here, 240. I put my 20 amp circuit here, and I I took my number 12 conductor. Suppose that. Look at the controller. E is a controller. F is your um, uh, your the one horsepower motor running at 240. It's a single phase. It needs two hots. The only thing that's missing from here is the ground. And you take the ground right here, and you take the ground right here, and you take the ground right here. See what it talked about the ground? You take the ground with all these conductors. Here's my disconnect. Do I need a fuse? You don't need a fuse unless the manufacturer asks for a fuse, uh, extra protection for the equipment, then you provide a fuse. Any question, guys? So 240 bus panel, 20 amp circuit breaker, two pole. Uh, number 12 conductor, uh, two-fold disconnect switch, and, and overload protection. This is, yeah, I see what they, they, they're providing the fuse press here. That fuse is actually providing not overcurrent, providing an overload protection. That's a good, that's where the manufacturer provide, ask you for a fuse to provide an overload. Fuse also can provide an overload protection. And then two-fold pressure switch right here comes with the equipment. And off it goes with a uh, one horsepower, two forty single phase motor. That's all what you need to do. Any question about this pump? Now this pump could be submersible pump, like we're going to see, or jet pump. The only difference is how they work. So let me show you. Um, now you wouldn't see this one in your house. Here is another pump. The most common ones, um, Chris, is is something very similar to this. The most common one. Is something similar, very similar to this. And here's my panel. My panel is located right here, and you come with an over temperature device right here. Um, come, here's my panel. My panel and over temperature device, and you go all the way and feed it. Okay, the first thing you need in a switch, right? We know what a switch is, this connect switch. Here's your pressure switches come, the pre wired. Um, and then you come over here, controller. To control the whole system on, on and off, and you take a cable. This is special drop cable. Can you see that? That's we don't provide this, provided with the equipment. And this one is called submersible pump. You know what they do? They take the whole pump, unlike the jet pump, they take the whole pump and you dump it right in the bottom of the well. So, what does that if it's at the bottom of the well? Obviously, it starts rotating centrifugal pump, drives water up. So, you have a centrifugal pump and and you know, as it rotates, it pulls the water through the pipe. So what's the advantage of this? As you guys can see, you only have one pipe. Can you see it's only, there's no jet pipe and dry pipe. Only one pipe. Um, and everything is right into the well. The tank has to be up. So the only thing I want to bring to your attention, guys, is you need grounding. Very big deal. You take a grounding over here, then from here. Then this has to be grounded all the way to here, and the ground is going to go all the way to the equipment will be grounded uh, with the cable, and the, the and and, uh, and the casing have you have to ground the casing too. Any question about this? Yes, sir. Um, how do we uh, keep that warm enough so it doesn't freeze? You put the way they do that. Well, they they put it below the. The freeze it below the uh, frost line, uh, so you bury it down, deep down. Yeah, what is it, six feet or, I can't remember. It depends, six feet, so they bury them deep. Very good point in Minnesota. How did you do it? Yeah, that's right. That's right. The earth is warmer. The earth is warmer. The earth is 20, 20 degrees Celsius on average. So you bury it, if you bury, I think, it, what is it, four feet? I want to say four feet. If you put it four feet, for the most part, maybe five feet, you're kind of... Is it okay? Maybe between four or six, you bury it, then you you're you're guaranteed it's below the. It's like the water coming to your house. Why would it freeze? Yeah. The same the same the concept goes below. And the flow will help it not to freeze though. Like when it becomes too cold, what do they ask us to all to keep uh to keep the faucets on to keep the flow? Okay, the same principle, guys. Forty. 
psi and 20 psi. It reached for, you need that you still need this pre-charged water tank. The pre-charged water tank is a control system because you don't want every time to flush the toilet, the pump will start. Every time you open the faucet, the pump will start. Otherwise, unless you have a pressurized. Pressurized maintain a certain pressure in the tank. You fill the tank up to here, uh, uh, all the way down, and then it starts. So it, it, it helps the pump not to kill itself by starting and stopping all the time. Any question? Yes, sir. From a maintenance point of view, which pump is From what I've never installed them to the truth. From what I've read about them, submersible pumps are the most common. If they're most common, most likely they're easy to maintain. They pull them off to maintain. They're more robust, they're meant to be buried uh, than the jet pump. That's what I. But I. That's what the book, at least, and what I've read about them. The most common ones is the one that you're looking at, submersible pumps. Uh, just FYI, I use other type of pumps because when I was doing uh, wastewater treatment plants and water treatment plants, they do the same concept when they. If you live in a, in, a, in a city and your area is lower than the wastewater treatment plants, so how are they going to take the sludge and the sewer system from your area all the way to the wastewater treatment plants? You know what they do? They collect them in a well like exactly like this, but that well is full of sewer system. And they pump it through big pipes, through pumps, submersible pumps exactly like this. They call them lift station. They, I don't know, anybody ever heard the word lift station? They collect them in lift station in the cities and they pump them all the way to the wastewater treatment plants. Right there, they process the stuff and separate the solids from the liquid and so forth. Very similar. They use submersible pumps all the time. I'm not going to tell you uh, that the cable, submersible pump cable, have to be rated to be submersible, right? That cable that goes all the way down. I'm not going to, you agree with me, that cable have to be rated to be immersed in not just what location. It has to be rated to be in water because it's sitting right here in water. Not any conductor can be rated. It has to be jacketed, manufactured to be submersible all the time. So you can't just put any cable down there. It's going to deteriorate all the time. Any question guys about this pump? How do you size for us guys? Um, uh, what, what's in it for us? We need to size over temperature device, the conductor, the disconnect. These are the most common. The controller and everything else comes as a package with it. Most of the time, 99% of the time, the tank will be inside the basement of the homes, the pressurized tank. And what, what, so that's, any question, comments? So that's basically about the pumps that they have. Here's how they wire them, typical wiring. Um, Nick, that probably would be for you. If you can see typical wiring, you come over here all the way, wire. If you can see, that's just a conduit coming from the pump controller disconnect. This is where your disconnect is located, right in here. You bring your wires right in the underground all the way to the casing. You do the connection right in here. But look at the water. This is just electrical. We, we're not showing the pipe. We're just showing electrical wiring. You, you bring PVC conduits. They're using UF cable. In this case, you, they're using UF cable, USE cable, or PVC conduit. Common UF cable is very common. Number 12 cable right underneath it, directly buried conduit from here, all the way up to conduit up to protect it. Uh, race will recover. So you put the UF cable or, or inside the conduit for physical protection, basically up here and up here as you emerge. And you tie them over here. Your disconnect is going to be located uh, inside for the pump. Um, and the idea is you will never ever be working on the pump, guys, unless you disconnect it. So what do you do if you're going to maintain the pump? You go to the disconnect, you disconnect it, lock it, tag it. If it well in residential, you just disconnect it and you go pull that pump to maintain it or do something on like it. Any question is about the wiring. You have cable in a PVC conduit. Um, for physical protection. Don't forget that you need an equipment ground conductor with it at all times. This is my favorite. It says the metal well must be bonded with an equipment ground conductor. So right in here, I don't know if they're showing it, right in here, um, I don't know if you guys can see that green, right here you're going to bond the casing. 
to the pump, everything has to be bonded. The casing has to be bonded. Any question about typical wiring for this? How deep can I put this wiring? Or is it 18 inches in a conduit? 18 inches in a conduit. If you put them in a conduit, it's 18 inches, PVC conduit, 18 inches below ground. Okay, now since this disconnect is not wood inside, guys, most of disconnects have to be uh, pump control and disconnect uh, switch. Disconnect must be inside of the controller and must disconnect the controller cable of being locked in the open position. So it's inside of the controller. If it's not, it has to be cable of being locked in the open position. So you can lock it right here in the off position. Like in this case, you need to be able to lock it so you can go work in a pump. Okay, any question guys about the pumps before we leave them? That's really what I want to say about the pumps. The only thing I want to say about the pumps, they are motors, they need a disconnect, they need a cable to power them, they need an overcaptation device. Um, how do we size all these? Exactly like a motor, based on the full load current and the horsepower and the voltage of that particular pump. Any question guys before I move to the water heater? Before I move to the water heater. Now, water heaters are appliances. Water heaters, guys, are appliances. Appliances need a couple of things to, to do. Number one, um, I want to bring to your attention, guys, this article here requires right here, uh, Chris. Appliances require a disconnect. I need a disconnect. Do you guys remember how when we went, did the water heater in our building? We said, unless the circuit breaker is within sight, you have to have a disconnect. Most of the time, the water heater is sitting right next to the panel, so you don't have a disconnect. Why? Because the circuit breaker is your disconnect. If you don't have a, a disconnect within sight and no more than 50 feet, then you need a disconnect. Very important. The second thing, guys, um, brand circuit to serve as a disconnect. This is where we said that this one that permits the brand circuit, uh, a circuit switch or circuit breaker to serve as a disconnect means if wood inside, this is very important. That's a rule that I told you guys when we were when we were powering our circuit, um, our water heaters in the building. I said if it's wood inside of a circuit breaker, that's okay. That's very important. The equipment of the conductor um, must be there. The other thing, uh, flexible connection. You need a flexible connection for the equipment. Also, the NDC code book says the water heaters, guys, cannot be plugged in. You can't plug in a, a, a water heater. You don't want to plug in a water heater. It has to be hardwired. Plugged in water heaters is no, no, no. Um, you need your water heater to be um, powered. So let's just um, let's take an example of, of, of how to size. I have an example I'm going to throw it for a water heaters based on the code. Um, how to size the water heater. Before, before, before you guys, um, uh, before we go into the sizing, how does the water heater works if it's electrical? They have two heating elements, lower heating elements and upper heating elements. One heating element, I can't remember which one of them is, fluctuates as every time you need hot, uh, hot water, uh, one of them will, key, will, will run to give you hot water. For example, if you have three showers in your house, and your, and, and your wife is also doing dishes and all the stuff, and you're using a lot of hot water, then the lower one will kick with the upper one to give you a lot of hot water fast. So these two elements, guys, are controlled, upper, upper thermostat and high temperature limit control, lower thermostat. So between the upper and the lower, most of them, the electrical ones, they can get you, if you need a lot of hot water in a short amount of time, they both fire. If you want it, if that's like a rush hour for hot water. Everybody's showering, bam, 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 the rush to get you to heat water fast. If you want a, a hot, to maintain the hot water, one of them will be working just to maintain the temperature in that tank of the hot water at a certain temperature. There's a lot of safety stuff, guys, there. Um, a couple of things, there's safety that it cannot, the water cannot reach. What's the danger of heating water? Anybody knows what a danger of heating water? What happened if you keep heating the water um, keep heating it. What's going to happen to the water? 
steam you steam it you know what happened to steam steam we use the steam to run generators in turbines that's how they generate electricity they, they keep heating the water until you convert the water into steam when you convert the water into steam guys it creates a huge amount of mechanical energy that you push that one on the um on the turbines and it pushes these turbines and that's how it gets your rotation to create electricity most of these nuclear nuclear plants coal plants they all use turbines and how do they do that they heat the water pure pure water they heat it to the steam either by nukes or by coal that's how they do it and they push that steam right into the turbines and run the turbines when you have rotation to generate electricity what do you need to do just all what you have to do is generate rotation in a magnetic field and you get power so that's major things now if you keep heating that one what's going to happen steam what's going to happen to steam if it comes out of the the out, uh, out, out of the shower on your skin you burn you or it explode so there's a lot of safety valves and temperature safety limits so if the temperature in that tank reaches can't remember what is it 120 fahrenheit or whatever there's a higher temperature it reached that temperature we need to shut down that piece of equipment otherwise it will steam and either burn somebody or explode very very so the most and we rob my friend we don't care about this from an electrical point of view that's all mechanically inclined kind of all what we care about is power that piece of equipment for them so when you power it what do you need to do it's not within sight either you have to provide a disconnect right here or your over temperature device which is going to be coming from here this is my 30 amp. My over temperature device is going to be my disconnect if, it, if it's within sight, or I have to provide a disconnect. That's the most important thing for us. Any question, guys? Pressure, temperature, relief valve. Look at this. Anybody walked ever into a, a, a valve? Can you guys see that valve? That's what's going to open before that baby turns into a bomb. Keep heating, 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 it turns into steam, pressurized steam, and bam, it goes explode. Before it explodes, what's going to happen to that valve? Start releasing all that pressure. So there's a lot of safety issues, and I'm sorry, uh, Chris, when you read through this chapter, there's a lot of mechanical stuff. Read it for your own, guys. It's a long chapter. talks a lot about scale, scaling and, 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 and temperature and all this good stuff. As far as we're concerned, we're going to be talking about how to size the equipment, we need an over condition device, a disconnect, and a cable. And that's what I'm going to do it in a second here. The article that talks about it is Article 422, guys. I want to remind you, Nick, Article 422 says the following. If, if the equipment, if the appliances is, uh, what is it, 13 amps or less, if I remember right, 13 amps or less, your over condition device must be 20 amps. If it's higher than 13 amps, then when you size the over temperature device, you size it based on 1.5 times the full load current of the equipment. Let's do that. If you guys, I want, I would like to do size the following. Um, for this pump, use the example that they're using. Okay, rounding and bonding. Heating elements, 45, 55. Okay, water heater. Let's take this example that they suppose. Suppose I have 45 K, uh, oops, 4.5 KW. I have a heater that's rated 4.5 KW, and this heater is running at 240 volt. So the full capacity of this water heater, electric water heater, is uh, 4.5 kW, guys. Okay? And I need to size the following. Number one, guys, what I need to find is uh, conductors. Conductor size. Here's what you do. You find the I, take the I, take the 4.5 K, divided by 240, and this will give you 18 amps. Right? Find the amps. Give you 18 amps, right? That will give you 18.8. 18.8 um, 18 amps. Let's go with the example that they do. 18.8 amps. Any question, guys, about finding the full load current of the uh, appliances? Right? Right, uh, 
1829. Okay, the second thing, guys, the code considered um, the code the code considered water heaters as continuous appliances. Article 422 will tell you it's a, co a continu continuous appliances. So what do you do for continuous loads? 1.25 times 8.8. .8. What do you get? Uh, you get 24 amps. 24 amps. Okay? 24 amps. Right? 24 amps, give or take. Then you take the 24 amps, take it to table 310.60.50B16. If you're using if you're using an NM cable, let's use an NM cable. Um, uh, you still need to go 310.15B16 under 70. Um, under 60 degree column because we're using we're using an N M cable to feed that one. And what's the conductor under 60 degree that you need, Chris? Number number 10. So I need a conductor of number 10. Two conductors number 10. Two conductors number 10. Okay, cool. Piece of cake. Piece of okay. cake, two conductors, number 10. So the last thing, guys, we need to do, so that's number two, so two conductors, we need the overcurrent protection device. The overcurrent protection device from um, 430, for uh, 220, the overcurrent protection device from 220, conductor size, uh, let me get my, my cable here. You size it based on 1.5, 220. Let's go to 220 appliances. If you guys go to 220. Dot, uh, I'm sorry, 422.11e, single non motor operated appliances, it tells you 150% of the full load current. So let's take 150 times 18.8 uh, .8 equal. Well, you don't take the time to derate it amount? No, not derate it amount. So we're going to go, which derate it amount talk about? Well, you already multiplied it by 1.25 because it's continuous. 1.5 times 18.8. .8. Not the 24, the 18.8. .8. Okay. I take the full load now, multiply it by 1.5. Are you talking about using? Well, you just got done multiplying by 1.25. No, that's here. I don't start, I start with the full load there. Right. Okay, what do you get? What do you guys get? How much? Thank you. That will get you 28 amp. Then if you take 28 amps, guys, take it to 240.6. What's your next over temperature device? 30 amps. Then you ask yourself, back to the small conductor rule, can number 10 be protected by 30 amps? If I came up with 40 amps here, suppose I came up with 40 amps here, what's going to happen? Two options. Either you have to change it down to 30 amps and take a chance that it will blow up, um, not blow up, it will, uh, it will trip, or change this one to one. Number eight. Does that make sense, guys? The calculation here is straightforward, continuous number 10, over temperature device 30, then can, because these are small conductor rule, up just only up to number uh, 10, the small conductor rule. Ask yourself, can number 10 be protected by 30 amps from a small conductor rule? Yes. If it wasn't, what do you need to do? You need to up the number 10 to number 8. That's it. That's all what you need to know about, um, about uh, um, water heaters. We need a conductor for them, so that will be basically 10-2, uh, 10-2 NM cable. So it's going to be 10, um, number 10 uh, for the two or 10, 10 slash 2, um, number 10 slash 2 um, uh, NM cable, 10-2. Two. two conductors, number 10, with a ground, of course. Yes, uh, all the people. 1.5 here? No, number two. Yeah. 1.5, yeah. 1.5 is coming, very good point. It's coming from 422.11. 422.11. 
422.11e in the code. The question is not all the people, my friend, saying, where did that number, did you brought this one, Chad, from your basement? This is coming from 422.11e, from 422.11e. And 422.10a, this number here came from 422.10a. That will tell you guys it's continuous load. That will tell you it's continuous load. 120% of the marked rating or not less than 100% of the marked rating of the branch, blah, blah, blah. So that's where you take 120% uh, when you size the, um, the branch circuit for the equipment. E1. E1, yes. E E1 yeah. and E you're gonna go all the way to E3. I'm just, the meaning of E1. Not exceeding the marked on the appliances. Yeah. That rules. That's manufacturer. Suppose the manufacturer, you did this calculation, beautiful, but the name plate says 25 amps. It rules. Done. So that's always rules, what the manufacturer see they want to do. Um, not exceeding 20%, blah, blah, blah. So, what will that be on the name plate. On the name plate. So full load amps. Full load amps. Okay. Uh, oh, uh, this one, um, over temperature device, it will be, no, it will be um, a fuse or circuit breaker size or over temperature device size. Okay, well, the, no, not the name plate. No, they will tell you over temperature device size, circuit breaker size, fuse size. These are the terminology that you're looking for. Yeah. Name plate, it has to have name plate. Usually, have the KW. Any question, guys, about what we need about this um, this water heater? Just to recoup continuous load 120 for the cables, I need an over temperature device. You size it based on 150 of the full load current, and you go up. You need a disconnect within sight. You need a disconnect within sight. Um, you can't plug in a water heater. It has to be hardwired. You flex the last piece of the water heater. You flex it, um, or you have a co or we have NM cable, cable it for ease of installation and movement and so forth. Um, that's it. How does it work? Two. There's two heating elements. They work together for the rush hour to get you a lot of water in a short amount of time. Otherwise, one of them will maintain the level of t the temperature um, inside that tank at a certain level. Um, there's a lot of control, as I said, from a mechanical point of view, there's relief valve here so you don't steam and blow up the house with, with water tank. Um, so if it reaches, if everything, all hell break loose and you start steaming and the temperature controller is not working, all that steam, you go to your water heater. Have you ever seen any one of them steaming all the way up? So you know you have to shut down the system. <laughs> yeah. It could. It did? Yeah, it was a new about six months ago. It just blew up, yeah. You can't believe pressure. It's unreal, the pressure that can create it. Okay, any question guys about the water heater and the pumps? Does it make sense? No, yes? <clears throat> the last thing, this is different heating elements that the guys go into it, read them on your own. Here's how it works. <clears throat> As I said, guys, if you uh, you can you can jump this one. You can choose um, to make the to make this one a 38 by 5. Wait a if you put them in series or parallel, you can take um, take different elements, jump them to get you the heating element number one, the normal, and the heating element number two. So different ways of of getting you. We don't get into the guts of wiring them. Um, you really you take L1 and L2 that will give you 38 watt. If you want more heat, you tie L2 and L3 together, so that gets you two heating elements. So, part of connections for them. Okay, the last thing I want to talk about, guys, in this chapter: any question about water heaters and pumps? 
that's really what I, wanna, I don't want to go through the PowerPoint presentation. These are the major parts that I want to touch on. I want to emphasize water here have to be grounded. So you need an equipment grounding conductor with it. <clears throat> okay. Since water heaters are air conditioning are big consumers of power, and since we're becoming huggy feely, more and more huggy feely, more <clears throat> environmentally friendly, the utilities guys want to limit, they want to control your behavior now. It's called behavior control. They want to control your behavior. Take this, if every one of us guys goes and shower at the same time, and, uh, and you have electrical water heaters, you're going to consume a lot of power. The electrical utilities consumption of power is going to go so high. Two things could happen. Blackouts or they have to size a system so high just because your behavior and mine are not willing to change. So imagine if there are shower, like exactly for a shower. A shower for the power. Um, they do Air conditioning is a big deal, guys. What they do is uh, the safety switch. Everybody knows what the safety switch that Excel is using. What they do is they take your neighborhood <clears throat> and they circulate their air conditioning. They put, say, eight, eight homes in your neighborhood. That's very important because that down to the distribution line. In your neighborhood, they take eight homes, put them on a 15-minute cycle. They're on, and the other eight homes in the same neighborhood on the same distribution line off. So by doing that, they can cut if their load at one moment, guys, was 100. Let's say the load was 100 kW for Excel at one moment by recirculating the load splitting it their peak will go down to what 50. who cares the question is who cares if uh, <clears throat> if they don't do that they have to the transmission lines their transmission lines have to be bigger just for a short amount of time or you're going to have a blackout you're going to drop you the fuse is going to the voltage will go down the fuse will open and you will have a blackout so the smarter than chad decided hey how about if we control the behavior of the customers and give them incentives so they give you incentives this is one way of doing the incentives. Really interesting. I want you to look at this one. This one is called um, electric water heaters. They have they have a separate water heater for you. Yep. This is off peak. So what they do? I want. I don't know how how many of you guys have a power. Here's your meter. This one is the meter that that measures your power to the house. That measures the house. They took from the line side another meter and they only fed the water heaters. Another meter, I can do that. Can I tap from the line side of the, of, of the meter? That's not even my territory, that's the Excel territory. So came here and put another meter. <clears throat> What's the problem with this meter? I don't know if you guys can see this tiny little switch here. This one is controlled by the utility. So by doing it this way, they can close this contact here and control when you can when you can use this power, and when the and incentives for you say basically they control when can you use your water heater. What's the incentives for you when you when they close if they can control it they can get you suppose that you're paying here uh, let's say seven cents uh, per um, kilo watt hour here. This one if you allow them to control them will give you three cents per kilowatt hour so great now i have i have incentives to get um and again they can't force you it's incentives the incentives is you have lower <clears throat> electric bill lower electric bill any question about this how does this work they can control it from right in here guys um, if you can see that one hop is coming through here to a contact this contact when we are not at the peak so at night when people are not there they can allow you to use your water heater to heat a lot of water because nobody's using it by controlling this one they reduce their peak they call it a peak peak shaving any question guys about this off peak so this is off peak they allow you to use your water heater when when the grid is not off peak to give you an idea of what peak and non-peak is suppose that the peak is right in here this is my load. This is the load of the, the peak of the utility. Then it keeps going down here and it stabilized right like this. So, oops, it goes like this. This area here, from here to here, they really don't want you to use the water heater. So, I don't know, this probably would be from 
held me here from 4 p.m. into 8 p.m. From 4 to 8 p.m., everybody's going home, cooking, air conditioning is running, we're doomed. <laughs> A lot of consumption of power. If they can control from 8 p.m. to 8, 4 p.m. to 8 p.m., you cannot use this, it's controlled, it's open. After and before that, they close their contact so you can use it. <clears throat> so suppose the peak for them at this point, guys, here was, let's just say, 100 kW. If they allow you to, if they cut you down, you can go down here to uh, maybe 50 kW. I'm just throwing this one, 50 kW on the line that's coming to your building. Who cares? No blackouts, smaller conductor to neighborhoods. Big, big deal, guys. If Excel can, if we can control, like rush hour, if I can control when people can come, imagine, we don't have to build more highways. The problem is we all rush at the same time and we create the rush hour problem and jams and highways. That's exactly for the power. For a short amount of time, that time, especially for us here, from 4, 4 to 8 p.m., a lot of people are cooking, going home, doing a lot of stuff. Air conditioning in the summer, air conditioning is on. We peak in the summer here because air conditioning is on. So if they can control your behavior and not run the... Um, the water here at this time, shift it to after 8, and just throwing these numbers, or before 4, um, then, they can, um, then they can reduce their inrush and P. Any questions guys about this? What's in it for you right here? You pay less. You pay less. So that's off-peak. That's one way of doing the off-peak. Any question about this way? Uh, the second, the second one here. Here's another way of doing it. Look what they did here. They saved themselves. They say, you know what? We're going to save ourselves another meter. We're going to save ourselves another meter, and we're actually going to have a. Uh, here's my contact. I'm going to be controlling. Can you guys see that contact? Instead of having two meters, this one is more likely. Only one contact, they allow you to they power you from the here. Then at this time, they said, we will control this contact. We're going to basically turn it on and off whenever there is no peak. So again, back to my, my example, coming out of here, we're peaking here, coming down here from my 4, 4 p.m. to 8 p.m. here. This area is no use. So what they do is they keep this, you see that little switch with the signal, with a signal from radio frequency signal, guys, or a signal on the power lines, they can open this contact to a relay and keep this contact open for four hours here, that four-hour period, and I'm throwing these numbers. They could be anywhere. They keep it open, so you can't use it even if, I, if you want to. You can't use it even if you want to. After that, what, what would you do? After that, they send the signal, shut it down, and you can hit what? What's in it for you? Here, they give you an incentives. They give you, instead of three, like we did, they give you a reduction. If you participate in this, like Excel is doing it right now with air conditioning, they give you a reduction in your monthly pill, um, certain amount of money, if you participate in this. Anybody has any of these in there? Anybody has electric heater? You have electric no, heater? Air conditioning. Air conditioning, safety switch. I do have in my house safety switch. Anybody has a safety switch that Excel use it? Safety switch is slightly similar to this, but slightly different. We're going to talk about safety switch. So this one is off-peak too. Another way of doing off-peak. They're controlling the way you, you, you use these appliances. Why do you guys think they want to control this? This is 5K load, 5KW. Just to give you an idea, Rob, you know how much Excel can allow you on average, can, can assume that you're going to be using on average when you design a system. They're assuming your house is not going to consume more than 10 to 15K. So when we design a system, 10 to 15 K, KW, is the, what we're assuming my house is going to take on average. Now, guess what? The water heater by itself is taking one third of this. And if yours is, is taking one third of this and yours is one third of this, the distribution line coming is going to go down. Before it goes down, they have incentives to control. Just for a short amount of time, if we go rush hour, big deal for itself and the utilities. And the smart grid, did you guys hear about the smart grid? The whole smart grid is, is controlling people's behavior. They're turning the major, not the fridge, care less about the fridge, air conditioning, water heater. Uh, these are major things that you can live without your water heater for a while, you know. 
um, for air conditioning, we can live without it for a while, turning on and off. These major equipments, they can control it. incentives for you. What's incentives for you? You, you reduce your monthly payment. So here's another way of reducing uh, the inrush. This is what um, what you're talking about here. This is not the more common one, guys. This is a relay. That's what Excel is using right now uh, for air conditioning. So here's my air AC. This could be for all practical reasons. My AC and my AC is coming from a disconnect here. And then you wire your AC to this box. And out of this box, you go to your um, actually your equipment right here. This box will be wired right here. Another disconnect and go down to another switch. So I can have this is water heater. I, I had it in my house as an AC, not a water heater. Same concept. This really can receive a radio frequency signal. You can see them green or red on the front. Red means it's it's up and running, but it's controlled, meaning it's off. The contact is off. We don't want you to use this water at this moment. What's in it for them, guys? They can make you use it and not use it and fluctuate using it any time of the day based on the peak of the grid. So by controlling your AC or water heater, they give you incentives. They reduce your monthly pill during, if it's the AC during the summer months, um, if it's water heater all the time. So Chris, did you say you don't have your water heater? Most of the water heaters in Minnesota is gas, aren't they? Yeah, most of the water here is here, at least in Minnesota, most of them are water, gas, am I kind of, give or take. Um, so we don't see that this on a water here, but you see a lot in an AC. What's in it for them? Reduce the peak. Why? Because blackouts, and they get penalized for blackouts, guys, too. And also, and people, customers get mad and they get penalized. Um, and, or... They, they reduce, if they don't do the blackouts, then you have to, instead of using one odd, they have to use two odd conductors. If, if it is, instead of the transformer, is going to be 500 kVA, it's going to be 1,000 kVA because you're sizing based on the peak. They don't want to size things based on the peak. They want to size it based on the average. Um, and a peak is completely different than average. Any question, guys? So your house might peak at 25 kW, but your average is 15 kW. So they want to size for the 15 kW. Yes, sir. Defeat the system. Yeah. I'm sure there is. They, they, you know, they, they have a, a stamped plug on it. If you can, if you get into this, all what you have to, you can bypass this one from right here. You just bypass the relay, and your off it goes. But you have. Don't they stamp it? They stamp it though. You have to cut that little wire there. I guess there's always a way of doing it, but if you cut, you have to cut the little wire to get into the box. It's like the meter. Can I open the meter? Yeah, you can open the meter. There's a little wire, safety, what, what do you call it? Um, not safety, uh, tamper wire that you have to cut to open the meter. And then if you open the mirror, take the mirror out and you there's a lever there, you shut it down. Now you don't even have meter. You're not metered. If you try to do that, what they do, guys, what they do, all the utilities, not just Excel, they, they draw a profile for you. Every house has a profile. So suppose Chad Kirti is paying for 1,000 kilowatt hour every month, and all of a sudden he's paying for 300. There are two ways. Either the guy's stealing, or he divorced his wife and, and kicked his kids out of the house. There got to be a reason for me to go from... A thousand kilowatt hour a month into a 300. So they they they'll check on you. That's how they catch people who are cooking uh, meth. Do you guys know that? Serious? By uh, by all of a sudden, your in your house, your consumption over the last five ten years has been a hundred kilowatt hour, and then all of a sudden it or a thousand, you double to three thousand. So they're cooking something down there. The police can use this as a, or your consumption of water too doubled or tripled. Now, if you are within 25% up and down, that's acceptable. But you could double and triple this. You're cooking something. Or you, you're, all your family moved and lived with you. Or you've got to be a reason for that. So they have profile for you. Don't worry about them. Like no, they, they keep track of, of your consumption. Keep track. Yeah, keep up your track of your consumption. There's month one, two, three, all the time. And they draw profile for you. So if, they, if they shut you off and the power doesn't get down, yeah. 
Okay, and if you if uh, all hell break loose and you really don't want anybody to control your your water heater because you want to shower whenever you want to shower, and you are anti-government, anti-establishment, anti-everything, um, and you just want your independence from the grid so you can power yourself and no problem. I'm going to pay seven or eight cents for everything. I don't want anybody to control when I can shower. That's the way you do it, right? There is no control, nothing. You just brought the power in here, and you're going to pay, pay your uh, eight cents per uh, kilowatt hour. And I care less. I have the money to pay it, and don't control my AC, AC or don't control my water here. Still an option. This is America. You have a choice, right? Any question is about this? So you don't see anything. You see the this is your thirty amp. This is your number ten. Conductor, nothing, no control whatsoever. You just run it whenever it's needed, whenever you need the heat. Any question? Okay. So that's. So I have to put that one. And then the rest of them guys talk about the temperature and all this good stuff. Um, this is a good one here. The, what happened, since the water heater guys is a resistive load, resistive load, look what happened to resist what, what, when the voltage fluctuates. Suppose that you have, um, suppose you have a 240 volt system as you should. A 240 volt system, the one that we did, if you are running at 240 volt, this should be 18.8 amps, and the starting current, I don't know, probably the starting current for this one will be, say, 60 amps from cold, just cold, start it, because we're in rush. Look what happens if the voltage uh, increased by 10%. Okay, what's 10% of two, uh, 10%, so that, so that would be 10% to 240 is what? 2.4? 2.4 plus 120, so that becomes 2, 4, Help me here. 242.4 volts. So if the voltage went to 2, well, am I doing it right? Uh, so it went to 242.4. This is 10% increase in the voltage. Or no, that's not 10%. 24. 24. Gosh, gosh. I thought that, well, I'm awake here. So it's going to be 2 plus uh, 6 plus uh, 264. Thank you. 264 volts. If the voltage became, look at this high, 264, what's going to happen to the current? Goes down. What's going to happen to the air rush current, too, if you're starting at this voltage? It goes down. Now, if the voltage goes lower, so this is, um, what is 60? 240 minus 24 is what? This voltage will be 2, 2, 216 volt. If you have 216 volts, very hot, very low voltage because voltage drop. That's 10 percent. Look at the the current is going to increase 11 percent. That's dangerous. What's going to happen to your conductor when your current increases 11 percent? Increase 18.8 by 11 percent. So say go 1.11 uh, times 18. 1.11 times 18. We're talking about motors here. No, we're talking about heating elements. This is for the water heater. Motors on the table. Uh, they will show an approximate change in the full load current and starting current for typical electric or motors. Okay, you're right, motors. Or he even heating elements will, will affect. What's that? 21. So look at this one. You're going to have a 21 amp. Now, what happened if you size? What happened if you size your conductor, guys, for 18 amps? You oversize. You, your conductor will. Uh, your conductor in this case will uh, will uh, overload. So anyway, so that fluctuation 10 plus the motors, um, if you read through it, Nika made your motor plus or minus 10 percent. They rate it to work sufficiently. What they're telling us, if you guys have a motor, well, most of the equipments are rated for plus or minus 10 percent. They're saying your voltage can go as low as 216 or as high as 264, and you're still within the acceptable parameters. Within the acceptable parameters, meaning no smoke is coming out of that. Um, it's still working, but not as efficient, but not dangerous. Any question, guys, about the, the voltage variation in equipment? 
be it motors or be it um, this one happened to be for motors. Thank you. Um, be it motors, guys, or be it any any type of equipment. Thank you. You won't get hot, hot water. Uh, yes, yes, but but in in a resistive heat to a to a point though, um, as you go up on a resistive heat, the as the voltage goes up to a point, your equipment could burn to a point to a point. So it's not open ended. It's easier to lower to go lower on a resistive heat than to go higher. So if you have a heater that's rated for 240 and you give it 120, guess what? You're going to get one fourth of power, but you're not going to get smoke. Right. If it's a motor and you got one half of the voltage you had rated for it, instead of giving you one fourth of power, it gives you a full smoke. Thank you. That's a good point. Any question, guys? Any question? So that's basically what I wanted to touch on that one, motors um, and water heaters. We've got the trying to see time of use, water pumps. We talked about these, uh, submersible pump, uh, different type of motors. You guys will look at the motors, the overload, the disconnect. We talked about the grounding, water heaters. Um, a couple of typical sizes that they throw guys from 1500 to 5500 water heaters, two elements. Talk about this one. Um, here's the the pressure, the scaling water, and a temperature limit of 120. So if you go higher than 120, shut you down because you don't want to the you don't want you to hurt somebody with it. Um, circuit for water heaters. Uh, state the house size over protection device. We looked at that one. Um, resistive heat element. Here's the um, Chris. Thank you, my friend. The plus and minus for NEMA for motors. Plus and minus 11%. Um, that voltage variation. Okay. Heat pump water heaters. I don't know how they use the heat pump water heaters. They take the they use the ground temperature, I think, to, to, to do a heat water. Not a biggie for all of us. Okay. Any question, guys, about the, any question about the pumps? The pumps, the water heater, as well as the metering equipment. Yes, sir. Is there like a standard chart out there that tells you only those that change each of for a certain amount? I'm sure there is. Is there anything in the book? I'm not sure if the, we have. Do we? Yeah. Don't they? Most of them are 45 kW for a typical house, 45 to 5 k. I mean, 4.5 kW to 5 kW, typical for a single dwelling units. I'm sure they how fast and there's a there's a rule among the mechanical guys. The good news is I can't remember if we have if they have this list here. On heating element wattage, uh, they have the temperature, the equivalent. Uh, there's there's a lot of rules. I know most of them probably it's going to be hovering around five kW. Okay.